Well, that's, that's cool. I don't know why. But yeah, um, what I want to talk about today is just how we use indexes to optimize certain operations that we talked about previously. Now, today's also career day, right? So that's why there's like a lot of people not here. Well, I mean more than usual not here. <laughs> so uh, we'll go through all this stuff. It's interesting because the, the whole quiz thing that I want to show you is something that's popped up on the internet in the last two or three years. It's surprising how few people actually understand how indexes are used by databases. So my hope today is that I'll impart some of that knowledge. And then we'll go through this little quiz at the end that's on the internet just so that we can see the application of some of these things. Talk through maybe this answer, maybe that answer, and hopefully by the end of it you'll say, okay, I think I could do that quiz by myself, reason out the answers, and actually be able to pass the quiz. Um, every time I've taken it, I've gotten a perfect score, which is good since I teach this stuff. But um, yeah, and most of my students do too, but uh, it's just I want you to make sure that you understand how those things apply. Okay, so yeah, indexes, the whole idea behind indexes is that we have this data file that sits alongside of our table, and it catalogs the values that appear inside the data file, and then has references to different records in the data file. So typically, the data file being referenced is a heap file, and the indexes are an alternate access path. We call them access paths for how to get to particular tuples with specific values. So that's why we call them access paths. And so, <clears throat> indexes can be used to optimize some lookups. Now, if you think about what things could it optimize, probably not project, <laughs> probably not. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ones because it actually can optimize a lot of things like sorting. Obviously, you can get rid of sorting if your index is a sequential index. It can optimize joins. It can optimize selection. It can actually optimize things like set unions and set intersections and sometimes um, uh, duplicate elimination as well. So you can use indexes in a lot of different places. So what the optimizer needs to do is, it first of all has to be aware of what indexes are good at and what indexes are bad at. And that's why I want to talk about what they actually help with, what kinds of queries they help with. And we also need to know how much things cost. Because it may be that there's situations where the index actually generates a more costly result than unindexed access. And that's one of those head scratchers for people who just sort of hear, put an index on it and it'll be faster. And it's like, well, that, there's actually a lot of situations where it's not. And that answers the question, why is it that my index that I thought would be useful isn't actually going to be used? And so we'll talk about a few situations like that. Um, that's one thing that this quiz actually doesn't have some good answers for, which makes me sad. Because there's situations where uh, you might have you know, you add an index and you think the query will use it, but for reasons that the database understands, but you maybe don't, it decides not to use the index. So we'll talk about a little bit of that as we get into it. Uh, we are going to talk primarily about B tree indexes, and, and I call them B trees just because I'm too lazy to say B plus tree, because B plus trees is what most databases use, so we just call them B trees. If you have hash indexes or things like that, you can obviously extend this material to apply to those things. But since most everybody uses B trees, then we're going to just focus on B trees. And like I say here, secondary indexes are what we're dealing with. And secondary indexes mean the index is not on the same search key as the data file, or I should say that uh, in the other order. So the data file is not ordered on the same search key as the index. So if we had that they were both on the same search key, then we would call them a primary index. And the primary index could then be sparse because we could hop into the data file and then hunt for the values that we're actually looking for, taking advantage of the record ordering that's already in the, the table file. But since our table files are normally heap files, the index is in a different order. So we have to actually record every tuple that appears in the table file in our index as well. So that's why this is very important. And here's the punchline. This is the underlying theme that you have to think about all the time when you're thinking about how a secondary index might be useful in various query scenarios. So like I say here, looking up rec records referenced by the secondary index typically massively increases the number of disk seeks that you have to perform. If you have a solid state drive, then your database engine should be smart enough, and a good one will be, 
to realize that disk seeks aren't a thing it has to worry about. And then in that case, indexes can actually be tremendously more useful in a more general way. But since we're almost always, if we're talking about very large data sets working with spinning magnetic disks, we have a seek, a disk head that has to seek back and forth. And so indexes seek, you know, they generate seeks. And so we have to think about when are they actually going to be relevant enough. Did you have a question, comment? Well, it's an interesting thing. I mean, yes, when you're talking about our very simple way of optimizing the heap file where we had just a linked list structure and maybe our linked list isn't in the same physical order, or I should say the logical order of the, in, the, uh, the linked list is not in the same order as the physical file order, then we have additional seeks incurred by that. But what we're talking about here is actually more basic than that because if the index says here are the files in order of name or employee ID, and I want to re retrieve employees whose names start with N or something like that, um, yeah, then the problem is that the table file itself may not have the records in sequential order by name. They may be all over the place. And so if we have a, a random distribution of values and we have basically random processes of adding and removing records you know, we don't have any guess as to that all the N records are going to be in the same blocks, all next to each other. And so if we use our index to look up all the people whose names start with N, then we end up having to hop all over our table file to retrieve them. And that's where we can end up generating a lot of extra seats. That's the idea. Okay? So remember, heap files will presume are in random order because that's the worst case. <laughs> the best case is that they're actually in some sequential order, but the database can't depend on that. So that's that's where we can get into trouble. All right, so let's go through this and hopefully it'll start to make sense as we go through this. So we talked about file scans where we have to evaluate a predicate against every record in the table file except in the special case that we know that the predicate is against the key and it's an equality predicate and so once we find our first record we can actually stop. Otherwise we have to scan the entire file. Worst case even with the key we have to scan the entire file. Now, if we have an index and it happens to be on the same columns that the predicate is evaluating against, then we may be able to take advantage of an index. And so we use what is called an index scan instead, and we actually rely on the index's organization. So like I say here, we evaluate some portion of the predicate against the index to try to narrow down in the data file where the records we're interested in might be. And then the index is going to have pointers to the actual table records because it's an alternate access path. So it tells us where to hop into the table file and we retrieve those records. And of course you can see that if we can't evaluate the entire predicate against the index then we may have to break our selection into multiple steps. So we use the index scan on some part of the predicate, generate a smaller set of rows, and then we apply the predicate, the, the remainder of the predicate to those rows that we selected to actually find the ones that the user is interested in. So we may have multiple steps now because of the index not necessarily including all of the columns that the predicate actually references. Yeah, if you have a conjunction, basically, you could do that. So uh, an and of various conjuncts, then that would be okay. If you have a disjunctive selection with or, you know, uh, disjuncts that are or together, then almost always your index becomes not very useful. Which is too bad, because there's actually interesting situations where you say if a value is null or the value is whatever. Because remember that null means I don't know. And so if you have a situation where you say the value is null or something else, then your database may not actually be able to help you very much, even if you build an index. Good databases might be able to, because oftentimes what you can do is you can take that disjunctive selection and break it into multiple individual selections, each of which uses indexes, but then you have to worry about the specter of disk seeks. So you always have to think about that as well. Anyway, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see, so indexes for different kinds of predicates. So B-tree indexes, obviously equalities are good. They're not the best because hashing is the best, typically. And comparisons are also good, which is really nice because B-trees, this is why we use B-trees almost all the time because they're good at multiple things. 
So any kind of range query, and that's typically what we call it is a range query, where we say I want to select things where the value is at least this, or at most this, or within some range, or so forth. Hash indexes basically only good on equality. And so the planner, when it's looking at what indexes are available, it has to ask several questions, you can imagine. It, it doesn't just say, hey, what indexes do you have, and on what columns are they? It says, what kind of index are you? And it may be, in fact, that you have a database that's clever, and you can actually say, well, I want to order on these three columns, but do it in ascending order on the first column and descending order on the second column, and the third co uh, column might be ascending order as well. Postgres is a good example where you can actually specify indexes with more sophisticated uh, sort of, add, how, how should I say, mappings from the column into the index. And, and Postgres is interesting even uh, further because you can build indexes on rows that satisfy certain predicates. You can build indexes on functions of certain columns. So you can do some very clever things in Postgres to optimize, uh, let's say, queries that involve function calls that are applied to certain columns. Or uh, queries that have some predicate. You want to optimize those particular kinds of queries. So there's, there's some really neat things you can do with indexes, but many databases don't actually support that. Nonetheless, the planner has to think about what indexes are actually applicable and useful. So quality on a candidate key attribute. So we know that we're going to retrieve at most one record. Zero or one record is going to be retrieved by this index scan. It's an equality on a candidate key attribute. So this is the, the cost that we're basically going to see. We have to start at the root node. And just like we kept having with all of those B tree operations, we start at the root, we go through the, the key pointer values, and it's, if it's less, then we go left, and if it's equal, we go right, and if it's greater, we take a step forward. And if we can't take any more step forwards, we follow the right pointer. So, and that descends us one level down in the tree. So starting with the root node, we navigate the B tree to find the entry for the record. Like it says here, one disk seek and one block read for each level in the tree. That's worst case. If we're using our index heavily, a lot of those higher level inner nodes are going to be in the buffer manager already. So we probably won't actually hit the disk for those things. But once we finally navigate down to the leaf node, then we have to use the record pointer to go into the table file. So you have another block load and another, you know, read, read the value. So that may be another disk seek as well. Okay. So this is the worst case estimate for looking up a record based on a key, a candidate key. So hi plus one seeks, hi plus one block reads. And this is hi being the height of the index or the depth of the index. And the plus one, of course, being the actual access to the table file. Okay? And like I was saying, most of the time, the index is going to be heavily used. I mean, if it's going to be an index for enforcing a key, then you're probably using a lot for doing uniqueness checks and things like that. So in that case, a lot of times the inner nodes are already going, or I shouldn't say all of the inner nodes, but many of the inner nodes may in fact already be in the buffer manager, especially the root one and maybe the, the second level ones. And so you, you're going to have a pretty fast access through that index if you have enough memory. So this was the worst case estimate. So a more optimistic estimate, <laughs> which I really like, because remember that even for very, very large tables, you probably can get away with no more than maybe five levels in your B tree index. And so maybe you incur two seeks and two block reads. That's pretty awesome. Maybe if you want to be a little bit more realistic, you know, you have a jimongous data file, you say, okay, three reads and three uh, seeks, something like that. Now, equality is on non-key. This is where it starts to get sad. This is where we start to cry a little bit. Um, we may have a lot of records in the table file that actually correspond to the value that we're, that we're trying to look up. And so the index is going to have those record pointers in, in the index file. And we should realistically expect that the record pointers in, I should say, that the records being referenced are in some random order. Okay, so that doesn't really help us very much. Like you see here, n is the number of records fetched via the index. And so we could incur up to n disk seeks and, and obviously n block reads on top of navigating the index. Okay. 
The presumption is I drop it. I want to find all the value or all the records with a value 42 for some column. So I get in there and I start going through the index, and each one of those records is in some random part of the table file. So I say, okay, I want to look up this one, and you hop over here. And I want to look up the next one, and you hop over here, and so forth. So you can see that that could be really gross. Now I say it's not nearly this bad. There's actually another interesting aspect of why this is usually not as horrid as it looks. Because remember that we oftentimes want to include the record pointer in the index's search key because it improves the performance of updates and delete operations. Remember that when I update a record in the table file or I delete a record in the table file, the corresponding index has to be modified to match the table. And so if I'm deleting the record, then I have the record pointer of the record I'm deleting. So why don't I hop into the index and use the search key from that tuple and the record pointer of that tuple to navigate the index to find exactly where that entry in the index is. And then I can just delete it. And so if I include the record pointer as part of the search key, then it's easy to do that. The other benefit of it is if the record pointer is part of the search key, then I, I have already said I have a run of search key values with the same value, but the record pointers will all be different. But since they're part of the search key, they'll be in increasing order. And if they're in increasing order, then I can do a sequential scan through my table file pulling each one of those tuples out in order. I hope you followed that. Because basically, if our record pointers are in increasing order and the, the operating system doesn't suck at keeping files unfragmented and, and in the same physical order as logically they are, then reading those things, so I say I want to seek to uh, block 5 and pull a record, and then I want to seek to block 23 and pull a record, and block 37 and pull a record, and block 45 pull a record, then that will incur a sequence of small seeks. I won't be hopping back and forth and back and forth across the disk platter. So that's why we can actually end up with pulling these records, and it, and it may actually not be too horrible. Okay, range scans, interesting. Uh, because remember that we're going to drop into the index, and since all the leaf nodes are linked together, each leaf points to the next leaf, we can drop in at the place we want to start doing our range scan and just follow through the leaves all the way to the end of the index. So like it says here, use the index structure, the inner nodes to navigate to the starting leaf node, and then you just traverse that sequence of leaf nodes. So in this case where I have this select star from employees where salary is greater than 85,000, I go ahead and um, navigate my leaf using the search key value of salary is 85,000 and that'll drop me into the starting point. And then I can just follow the leaves all the way to the end of the index and that'll give me my values. Okay. Now um, is the database necessarily going to use an index on salary in this case. Let's say I have an index that is only built on salary. Will the database use the index? You have to think about different scenarios because you can't answer this generally yes or no. Let's say that we're a big company like Walmart and we have 100,000 employees. I don't know how many employees Walmart actually has, but I do believe that it's uh, over five figures. Um, wait, six figures, I guess. And um, probably not a lot of them are earning over $85,000. So what would be the selectivity of that predicate? That's the question that the database has to ask. How many records am I going to actually retrieve? The other question that the database has to ask is, are all the values that the query needs to produce in the index. Notice I'm saying select star from employees. But I'm saying, oh, there's only an index on salary. Right? So if there's only an index on salary, what do I know I'm going to have to do for every record that matches from the index? I have to go look it up and retrieve it from the table file. And in that case, I will have probably a C. Because I'm not just retrieving the values that are 85,000, 85,000, 85,001, 85,002, all of that. 
And so I know that those records are not going to be in increasing order of record pointer. So I'm going to end up with a lot of seeks as I scan through this if I'm using the index to, to satisfy this query. So this is what the database has to ask. If I'm at a company where most like, let's say that this is Facebook, <laughs> right? Probably a lot of people are over $85,000 a year at, at Facebook. Okay? So the selectivity is going to be a lot higher, right? It's going, I mean, sorry, the selectivity is, is or I should say, the, the, yeah, the, the um, probability that a row is going to satisfy this is going to be very high. So if I'm selecting a lot of rows and then I have to turn around and look them all up, then using the index would actually generate a lot of disk seeks. And so in this case, the database would not use an index on salary to satisfy that. It's just faster to scan through the table. But if I have a very selective predicate where I select not very much, like at Walmart, then it would use the index because it would be cheaper to incur those disk seeks than it would be to scan through the entire table file. Do people understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? The database has to balance this. Indexes are nice because they tell you where to look, but then you still have to go there and get stuff sometimes. And if you do, then you have to balance the, the benefit of knowing where to look from just scanning through the thing. And scanning through a table file typically doesn't incur any seeks. Well, I mean one to get to the start of it, but then that's it. Now you can also do range uh, scans with less than or less than or equal, because what you do is you, you think about what the predicate's range of values is that it wants from the index, and so basically you can say, what's the lower bound? Well, if I have less than, the lower bound is minus infinity, and so I can just drop into the index at the leftmost leaf and follow through until I hit 40,000. So you can still use indexes for scanning uh, on range queries where you have less than or less than an equal type queries. So you can use indexes, you know, you, like I said, you basically what you would want to do on your predicate is figure out what are my lower and upper bounds for index whatever that you're considering and then use that to do your index scan uh, more efficiently. Okay? Questions? Yeah, so um, basically this is what I was saying before, um, and it gets particularly bad when you're doing range queries because when you're doing an equality query, you have the benefit at least that the rows, if you're using the record pointer as part of the search key, that the, the entries in the index will be in increasing order of record pointer. So that's nice. But when you're doing a range scan and you have multiple values, you know, multiple search key values that you're looking at, then you no longer have the benefit of the record pointers being in order. And so you're going to start incurring a large number of disk seats. Like I say, or potentially one seek per record retrieved. Um, usually not this bad because we have lots of memory nowadays, and so we could probably load a lot of the table into memory. And potentially one seek per leaf block in the index as well when we actually go to the next leaf. Okay. Now, obviously, if you don't have very much memory and you can only keep one block of the leaf in memory, then or one block of the index in memory, then you would definitely have this. Um, also, if you have a poorly maintained index and your leaves are not in order, then you could also have this. Okay? So this is, this is why we don't like to use indexes for range queries most of the time. And if you ever run into a situation where you create that index because you have a range query and you see if the, uh, the database is using it, you do an explain, and it's like, I don't, I don't want to use that index at all. I'm not touching it with a 50 foot, foot pole. Now you know why, because the database is actually trying to avoid incurring disk seeks. Okay, so HI is the height of the B tree index, and rows will match the predicate, and the index entries matching rows occupy B leaf nodes. So steps in their cost, so we navigate to the starting point for the range scan. Uh, we read through B leaf nodes, and obviously that's always going to incur B block reads. That should be pretty obvious. And then we'll fetch each of n records from the table file. And it could be, you know, the worst case, like I said, would be n disk seeks and n block reads would be the worst case. So this would be sort of the worst case cost for a range query that's using an index. So hi, that's the height of the index, n seeks. Um, 
yeah, navigating, you know, following each pointer to the table file to pull out that tuple. And then uh, that many block reads should be pretty obvious. Again, this is worst case. Um, now, like I was uh, sort of alluding to, and I've mentioned this to a few of you, that you can actually use a very interesting little technique for improving index scan access if you have the memory and the, and the number of records to warrant it and the time to do it. So what you do is you read in blocks and blocks of the index entries that you care about. So you have them in memory. Once you have them in memory, sort them on the record pointer. Because now what you're doing is you're saying, I want, you know, I need to pull all these tuples from the table file, so why don't I go ahead and pull them from the table file in increasing order of record pointer? And when you do that, then you end up with a more linear sweep, uh, sweep through the table file as opposed to hopping around it randomly. And so that greatly reduces the number of disk seeks. I mean, you still have the same number, but the, the, the total distance that the disk head has to travel is less. It's minimized. Okay? And obviously, if you don't have memory to load the entire index, you could load as many as you can, sort them, retrieve those records, load more, sort them, retrieve those records, and so forth. So that will still give you a benefit. The only issue, of course, is that the records are no longer in search key order, which may cause you to lose other benefits down the line. So remember we talked about Selinger optimization, where you can take advantage of records emerging in a particular order from plan nodes to optimize things higher up, group by, duplicate elimination, things like that. And obviously, using a technique like this destroys the search key ordering on your records coming out of the index. So again, you have to balance these things. And a good optimizer will consider these various options and figure out what's the best option and go ahead and use that. Okay, questions? All right, yeah, so like I was saying, um, this is the, the interesting trade-off that I think is, is worth keeping in mind when you're doing this stuff. A disk C can be as expensive as 10 or more sequential block reads. If you, if you think about it in that context, then you start to realize why a lot of times databases, when you create indexes and then do range scans, don't end up using the indexes. Because that disk seek is worth a lot of block reads. And so if I go ahead and just scan things linearly, um, you know, it may be that that actually is the cheapest option. So this is why planner optimizers sometimes make the choices that they do. Yeah, so index scans are good if you're only fetching a small number of records. Or, remember, the alternative is I can satisfy the entire query from the index itself. And we'll talk about that momentarily as well. <clears throat> actually, it looks like we'll talk about it next. So when you have, um, and we looked at this also in 121. I, I think that some of you sort of took note that you could do this kind of thing. But let's say that we had on our employees, we have departments, and we want to figure out the average salary, salary per department. And we happen to have an index, for whatever reason, that includes both department and salary. And this is a good way of arranging it. Um, we could also imagine that the index would be on salary first and then department second which would make it significantly more challenging to do this, but we could still scan the index, and it would still be better than scanning the table file itself, because the index records would pack, you'd be able to pack a lot more of them into each block. But if we have a situation like this, does everybody see how we could implement this query entirely against the index without touching the table at all? We have all the record, remember, this is a secondary index, so it has to be dense, so there is an entry in the index for every tuple in our employees table with that tuple's department and that tuple's salary in it. And this is really neat. This is one of the reasons why, even though you may not use something like this for range queries, if you have lots of grouping and aggregation, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to create an index with just the parts you'll need for the grouping and aggregation, because you can go ahead and do that kind of thing. All right? Um, I think people are generally familiar with this. Are there any questions at all about it? Okay. Let's see. So a complex selection. So we talked about conjunctive and disjunctive selection a little bit earlier. Uh, we have a couple of slides that talk about this. So we have uh, various selections, P1 and P2 and so forth. So we have various conjuncts in our predicate that may or may not individually benefit from an index. 
So we have to, and this is sort of the whole thing, you have to look at all the subsets and figure out, well, would this subset benefit from an index? Would that subset benefit from an index? So if we have a, only one part of it that would benefit from an index, then we can rely on one of our equivalence rules to say, well, I'm going to turn this selection into multiple selections. And I'm going to use that one predicate or that one conjunct that would benefit from the index lookup. And I'm going to apply that first and then apply the rest of the selection later on. So something like that can actually greatly improve the performance of a query. Okay? So that would be one benefit, conjunctive selection. Uh, let me see what I'm saying here. Yeah, so this is basically, I have multiple columns in my index, which we, we've seen some examples of this. But let's say that I have multiple comparisons in my predicate. And I'm thinking about, well, when can I take advantage of all of my comparisons in the predicate? And uh, when am I constrained so that I can't actually use you know, all the things in my predicate with the index. So I have a uh, table T with columns A through D, B plus tree index on A through C, and I have something like this. Given what you know about B trees, does this benefit from having the index? Think about how it might work in, you know, you've got your tree and you've got to navigate down, you know, using the search key and so forth. Think about what records in your leaves might actually be selected by this. So we have A is 5, B is greater than 3. We have an index on A first, and then B second, and then C third. So we can create a search key where A is 5 and B is 3, and navigate down to that part, and all the records with A is 5 will be next to each other. And then B will be in increasing order for all the records that have A is 5. And so we can easily do a range query. Uh, just traversing a little part of the, the index. So that's pretty cool. Now if we had something like this, select star from T where B is 45 and C is less than 12, can we create a search key for this? Yeah, unfortunately we can't. We only can if we already know that there's only one unique value for A in our table. And hopefully our statistics aren't wrong. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so basically we are stuck with this situation because the records that would satisfy any kind of, you know, I should say specifically, the records that would satisfy this predicate will be spread out through the index. And so we'd have to hunt through the index. Now it may still be that, um, well, so you can see here that uh, since I wrote this, this query in a very specific way, if I said select A, B, C from T where A, or f where B is 45 and C is less than 12, we could do it entirely from the index because we wouldn't be selecting D. We could actually just scan the index and do that instead. But since I have select star and we also need the D values, we can't just do an index scan to pull out the records that we want. We have to <laughs> pull records from the table to find out what the corresponding D values are. In this case, the database would just choose to do a table scan. Okay? Let's see. Finally, conjunctive selection, disjunctive selection. So uh, let's see, multiple indexes on the input table. Yeah, so like I was saying, we can sometimes take advantage of multiple indexes to do things like disjunctive selection by just having multiple selection clauses in our plan and then do like a union of them. You could probably just do a union all, which is fast because you don't, you're not doing any duplicate elimination. Uh, so you could do something like that. If you have conjunctive selection, then you have to think a little bit more carefully when you do that stuff. So A is 15 and B is 2, and we have two different indexes on T. Do two index scans to get the record pointers, and then this is where it would be a little bit complicated because we probably have to use some kind of hashing in, in memory data type or something like that um, to do the set intersection. And once we do that, then we could generate the results using the two indexes. Not very common in the wild. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but again, you know, if you think about writing a database engine and that optimizer, like the smarter the optimizer is, the better it's able to handle just whatever crap is thrown at it. And maybe this handles like 0.5% of the queries that your customers throw at you. 
but that 0.5% of your customers get really happy and then they're willing to spend money on your product. So you think you, you have to think about all the trade-offs when you're trying to figure out what rules to, to satisfy and so like all that all the stuff I was talking about with just multi-column indexes, that is much more important because that is much more common in database usage. Okay, let's see, yeah, row lookups based on column values. <clears throat> oh yeah, so this is just joins. We'll try to get through the join stuff pretty quick. Um, index nested loop is a very common optimization applied to nested loops. Okay. And in fact, this is something that MySQL relies on heavily because it only has nested loops. So it tries to use indexes as much as possible to optimize inner loop lookups. So like it says here, for each tuple T sub R in R, we use the index on S to pull all the tuples in S that will satisfy the join condition, presumably some attributes in R equaling some attributes in S. And then if they do, then we just add the joined results to our total results. So what's the cost of this? Well, it's pretty straightforward to figure out. We just look at, you know, since we're doing index lookups, we just figure out how much each index lookup costs. And we multiply that by the number of tuples in R. So we could do something like that. Number of block accesses, well, it's whatever the inner loop accesses plus the number of blocks in R, so forth, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so yeah, well, I guess we'll go through this. B sub R seeks, okay, because remember that, uh, you know, worst case, we can only hold one block of each table. So when we um, go retrieve the next block from R, We've already had to retrieve a bunch of stuff for S, so we have to do another seek to get to that block in R, and we need to go in and retrieve it. So B sub R seeks and block reads for the outer loop. And the inner loop is going to be however many tuples are in R multiplied by the cost of the inner part. So we won't really elaborate on that since we already talked about it earlier. Now, um, does this benefit from blocking on the outer loop? The answer is obviously yes. So again, you can do a blocked indexed nested loop join, and it will be even faster. So you can do things like that. I mean, why iterate over the, the outer table in tuples when you can do it in blocks? I mean, it just makes sense. Okay, yeah, so we have to consider these increased seat costs. So that's basically from the inner loop. When we're doing all this index lookup, because remember, we have to navigate down the index, and then we turn around to the table and ask for the record, because we're doing a join. And so we have to think about this kind of thing. So if you have indexes on both sides of the join, when will you have indexes on both sides of the join? What tables are you normally joining? I mean, go back to 121, right? Normalized database schemas. Primary keys in one table, foreign keys in another. Hey, guess what? Most databases build an index on the primary key columns and the foreign key columns to do all their referential integrity stuff quickly. So this is really common, <laughs> that I have an index on both sides of the join. And so since that's the case, basically, we want to basically put the smaller table on the outside loop because... You know, if we're iterating it in rows, or even if we're iterating it in blocks, we want to multiply the inner loop cost by as little of a value as possible. And especially because our B plus trees, let's say that we have like a thousand record table and a million record table. The distance, I mean, the difference in the depth of those two B trees is probably like one or two. It's really small. A thousand records versus a million records. Now, if you think about it, a thousand records, if they're small, then you probably fit that into a single root node. But if you have records that are like, say, 50 bytes to 100 bytes per record, then you probably have two levels in your B tree. And if you have a million entries, then maybe you have three. I doubt you'd have four. So it's, it's really interesting how um, the B trees are sort of like an equalizer in this index nested loop algorithm. The inner loop is probably going to cost about as much regardless of whether you have the big table or the small table on the inner loop. So you want to put the smaller one on the outer loop so that you multiply that inner loop cost by as little as possible. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, hybrid merge join. So sort merge, um, we expect to have things sorted on the join attributes, and most databases don't do this because we have heap files. But, hey, what if we had an index on the join attributes? 
on one side or both sides? Does that ever happen? Yes, like all the time, because we're doing normalized database schemas and we have indexes to do for, uh, referential integrity. So we can actually use that to do a hybrid merge showing. And we'll talk about this in terms of one sorted table and the other table is unsorted first. But you can do this with both tables being unsorted. But we have an index on the join attributes. And so what we do is we start by doing a merge join between the table and the index. So we know we ultimately want to do a join between the two tables, but we have only the index is sorted, so we do a join between the table and the index. So like it says here, the intermediate results will have one table's columns, and the other table, it will have record pointers. So the record that corresponds to the table, you know, the first table's uh, row. Then what we do is we sort those intermediate results on the record pointers so that when we retrieve those, it's in a nice, smooth sweep across the disk. And then we retrieve the actual rows and generate the final result. So this is a hybrid merge join. We're taking advantage of indexes to do a sort merge join without actually having both tables sorted. Does that make sense? I think I have pictures of this. Um, so left table has sorted records. It is sorted on employee ID, it looks like. Right table is not sorted, but it has an index. We merge join those things. So you can see we have the left table's rows, but then we have the pointer to the right table's rows that would go with those. We sort them on record pointers, so that they're actually in order. And then we go ahead and retrieve each record based on the pointer that, that's pointed to. Okay, does that make sense? That's the sequence of operations for a hybrid merge join. Now let's see. So um, yeah, we can do this with two unsorted relations as well. Not a big deal. So like I say here, um, some big benefits of this is that our indexes are almost always much, much smaller than the tables themselves because the records are smaller. And if the records are smaller, then we can get a big bunch of them into memory and we can sort them really easily in memory. And so doing this kind of merge sort turns out to not be too bad when you uh, have ordered indexes against heap files. Which is interesting, because I, I think I, I mentioned this in one of the 121 lectures. Postgres has this cool thing that you can artificially inflate the costs of various join algorithms. And so, for example, you can say, um, make hash join cost a million times more than it normally costs. And then it won't use it unless that's the only way it can satisfy the query. And then you have another flag that will set sort merge join to be like a million times more expensive. And so you can turn off hash joins so that it only uses sort merge. And it will do this kind of hybrid merge join thing. Because generally it, it ends up still being less costly than nested loop. Because we have a lot of memory. Okay. So drawbacks. The only problem, uh, or I shouldn't say the only problem, but the the bigger problem, um, besides having to do these sort load passes, is that uh, we lose our search key order. So again, our Selinger optimization uh, options may disappear. So again, a good database will say, well, here's one option. I'll cost it, see if it's good, put it in the notebook, and then I will cost the option that doesn't use hybrid merge join and see if it's better or worse. So it goes ahead and prices those out. Any questions? All right, you guys ready for your quiz? <laughs> so let me see if I have it still. Okay, here we go, Google Chrome. I don't know if you've seen this quiz before. I know, I don't know why it's a squirrel holding a lightsaber. Um, I have guesses, but I really don't know. Has anybody seen this quiz before? Okay, Eugene, you're not allowed to say anything. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, this tests just a small number of cases of like what we've talked about. And it's kind of fun because it at least promotes the fact that people need to think about this more. And uh, definitely a lot of, because I mean, does anybody know the statistics on this test? They administered it online for like two or three years. It went on Reddit a few times and people took it. Like 60% of people that took it failed it. Where failing it is missing three out of the five questions, because a lot of them are true or false, yes or no type questions. 
Okay? So it's pretty bad. But anyway, you can choose your database. And I will choose MySQL just because we're all familiar with MySQL. Can you all read this? Should I make it a little bit larger? There we go. Maybe that'll be a little bit, maybe I'll make it even a little bit larger. Is the following SQL good or bad practice from a performance perspective? So I have an index on my table, only including the date column. And then I want to select text date column from table where year of the date column is 2012. So the two choices, there is no major improvement possible or bad practice. There is a major improvement possible. What do you think? What? Do you think it's fine? <laughs> you could index the function, did we? <laughs> Postgres has this ability, which I think is so cool that it can do that. Yeah. So you can only index up in the data column, but then you can like pass it to the viewer. Yeah. So it's like a way to I mean there needs to be a way to instead of using your function to keep the logic. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like there may be ways of doing this. I mean, if you think about it, it'd be fun to have some kind of inverse to functions that you could use to generate a search key value that you could then use against the index in situations like this. Unfortunately, I don't know of any database that's intelligent enough to do that. Like not Oracle, not DDT. So like I said, Postgres, you can say, I want to create an index on this function, but then it just goes and blindly says, oh, you're calling this function, and I have an index that uses that exact call pattern, so I'm going to use the index, because the values, the search key values are already pre-computed. But yeah, calling the function turns out to kill the ability to use this index. So, but we'll talk about that in a second. We'll go ahead and, because unfortunately it goes ahead and um, takes all your answers. So this is bad practice. We think it's bad practice. Okay. So back to the squirrel with the lightsaber. To find the most recent row. So notice we have the index is on A and date column. We have select ID date column from table where A is unspecified. So that'll be passed in as a parameter value. Order by date column descending, limit one. First question, can we actually use the index to perform the selection faster? I'm hearing yes and no. Yeah, so I'm not asking about ID yet. Interestingly enough, okay, so there's a couple of aspects of this. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's so many different facets of this and I want to make sure I try to attack it in a clear way. But let's just look at the, the predicate. We have where A is equal to something. Can we use our index to do that? So we know at least that we can do that. Now, to get to your, your issue of, well, we need ID as well. So clearly if we need ID, we can't, we can't answer that solely from the index. We have to touch the table file. So the question is, how many rows are we going to have to do that for? And that's where it's very interesting because of the limit one, right? Yeah, in this case, regardless of the statistics, it is probably worth it to use the index. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because notice we're ordering by the date column descending, but our index is probably on date column as ascending. So our index scan is going to have to be a little bit intelligent. And this kind of gives you a peek into how clever databases can be. Because if you're doing this right now, you'd say, okay, I mean, this is the way NanoDB would do it if NanoDB could do index scans and so forth, um, which would be an awesome thing to add, hit, you know, big, big uh, push for that. But anyway, um, so we can imagine we're going to select all the rows out where A is whatever specified value. And we need to have them ordered by the date column. Well, we know they come out in increasing order, so we have to get them into decreasing order. Well, if we were more clever, then we could say, oh, well, I'll just get the last entry from the index, and I know that's going to be the descending order. And then I could just use that as my value. Now, that's one way that a database could, could evaluate this query. Um, and then, of course, at the very end, that's when we need to retrieve the ID. So, so far we've used only values from the index. A, we say A needs to be a specific value, date column needs to be the largest one, 
and then we retrieve the ID. So we don't need to touch the table file until the very last step. And we only need to get one row, so it's okay. But there's another thing that you can do with these, which I've mentioned to one or two of you. It's called a top n query. This is a top n query. It's a top one query. <laughs> and when you need to have things in sorted order, you don't actually have to sort all the results that come back. If it's a top end query. Let me try to see if I can explain this properly. So you have a top end query. In this case, I only have one value that I need to come back. When I get my first value from my subplan, I look at it and say, this is the largest value I've seen. And it becomes your top one. And then the next record comes in. And if it's larger, then you say, okay, well, now that record's my top one. And so forth. And you can extend this idea to top end by having n slots. And every time the subplan generates a new row, you insertion sort it into that n slots. Oh, that's a very good question. Would you prefer an insert? That's a, that's a very good question. You probably would want to do, because you know it's ordered, right? So you probably definitely want to do a heap sort. Yeah, that's a very good point. Because then you keep your heap around. And again, this is like the third way that people use the term heap in computer science. And so you could just keep adding a record into your heap, and the, the lowest one would fall out the bottom of the heap and you're fine. But anyway, top n queries can be optimized as well. And it's very interesting that they can do that. So there's a lot of, of mechanics that could be going on here. A lot of different ways we could um, implement a database that, that evaluates such a query. So we all, like how many people think good practice? How many people think bad practice? How many people don't care? There's a few people that, <laughs> or aren't putting their hands up. That's fine. So we'll say good practice. Okay. Test your SQL performance know-how in three minutes. That's going to become a lie for us. Two queries, searching by a common column. We have the index on A and B. And so we see that our first query is um, where A is 123 and B is 42. Will that benefit from the index? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, it, it will benefit. Um, probably. So we need to think about, again, what is the... Uh, what is the primary key? What's the selectivity? If this generated a million rows, then it would be bad. <laughs> so this is where statistics would give us a better answer. But in general, we can guess it'll probably be good. And what about the second one? Is that going to benefit from the index? Where B is 42. Well, the index starts with A and then, and then sorts on B. So in this case, the second index is going to be bad. Now, what would we do to improve this? Well, an obvious way is to switch the order of the index column. So create the index on B and then A. Or we could create a second index that's you know one on A and B, if we care, and then the other one on just B. Depends on what your needs were. So we'll say bad practice. OK, searching within a string. So I have an index on this text column. And then I have a like predicate where it says like percent term percent, which means term has to appear somewhere in the string, not necessarily at the beginning or at the end. So this is going to benefit from the index. That's exactly, you both are, are nailing it, yeah. Um, search, let me, let me think of the right way to say it. Indexes on strings are great when you're searching for, for prefixes. But they're terrible at just about everything else. Um, and like it says here, troublesome, there's a high risk for performance problems. You could, in fact, scan the index for your term if all the strings were small enough to actually fit inside the index records. But that's unlikely because you could have very long strings. So... High risk for performance problems. OK. <laughs> um, this one's an interesting one. I would love to keep going, but we're actually uh, over time. So let's just wrap this one up really quick. Current situation selecting about 100 rows out of a million. So create index A date column. So A is 123, group by date column. That doesn't seem too bad. Change query selecting about 10 rows out of a million. So let's see, A23, and we add in 
b equals 42. So the question is, can the first index actually benefit from the index? What columns does it reference? No, the first query. Select date column count from table where A is 123 grouped by date column. I'm sorry? Yeah, it basically only references A and date column, which are both in our index, so we can do this from the index. The query got changed, though, and now it also includes B. So what happens in the database engine? Yeah, so basically in that situation, well, but we group by date column as well. So, yeah, we might be able to come up with a way of structuring this, but we certainly can't benefit from the group by. Yeah. So basically, we introduce a single column, and now the database has to go touch the table instead of just using the index. Yeah. So the query will be much slower. And it's interesting because we have this thing that the first query has said it's going to retrieve 100 rows. The second query selects fewer things, so it seems better. But in fact, it's uh, going to be worse because we can no longer use the index. So we'll finish. Yay, we got five out of five. And what I'm going to do, since it's already over time, you can go to use the index loop or just search for index quiz in Google or whatever. And uh, you too can own a book with a jumping squirrel on it. So, any questions? All right, on uh, Friday we'll go ahead and start picking up transaction processing. Coolest time.